Hello and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Our guest tonight is famed professor of economics, Richard Wolf. Now, you may know him from Democracy at Work. He is the host of their nationally syndicated show, Economic Update. He has written several books, including When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself, Understanding Socialism and Understanding Marxism. Now, many of you may love Professor Wolf, but some others may think, oh, no, not the Marxist commie. Uh, and I am not promoting communism by any stretch of any imagination, but I do think that it is important we explore all ideas and keep an open mind. And he is one of the greatest known in this realm. Um, I don't think he is a communist, actually, but we'll ask him about that. Uh, we'll have him go through things, clarify things. It's going to be a very interesting conversation tonight that you will, wa you will want to watch no matter where you fall on the economic spectrum. Uh, because listen, we do clearly have an economic disaster that is looming and we cannot fix it by doing what we've always done. We've just been in this circus, so it's good to get other perspectives on this. Professor Wolf, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, uh, you're a professor of economics. You're well known for discussing uh, uh, really the structure, economic structures, and uh, people know you as a Marxist. I don't know if you would describe yourself as that. How do you describe yourself? Well, you know, because of the context of the Cold War in America, when people say that, I accept it. Uh, here's what it means. Marx was a great thinker, made an enormously important contribution to understanding the world we live in. Any educated person, uh, in my judgment, should read that. You don't have to be Catholic to appreciate that, that Thomas Aquinas and Augustine are great thinkers that we learn from. And you don't have to be a fill in the blank. So my opinion is, if you want to call me that, all it means in my case is I've read it, I've thought about it, I've learned from it, and I appreciate it. So really, anybody who's read the book then is a Marxist. So, yes, so yeah. many people would be, I suppose. Um, uh, let's talk about you know, why the economy, from your viewpoint, is uh, where it is and where you think the economy should go from here. Because we're seeing that you know, the banking system looks like it's failing uh, to a degree. They're, they're, they're desperately doing everything they can to salvage it, it looks like, with these banks going under, the smaller banks anyway. Um, we don't know what's going on with the dollar, the value of the dollar, what's going to go on with uh, Russia, China, them with their own currency. Really, they're attempting, it seems, to uh, break up Western hegemony, U.S. dollar right. hegemony around the world. So where where do you think, wh assess where you think we are right now and why we are where, where we are? Good. Thank you for asking. Let me try uh, briefly to answer. If folks watching this program are feeling that things are kind of falling apart, they should congratulate themselves because they've got it right. We are now kind of in the center of an accumulating multiple series of crises. Let me very quickly drive that home. In the year 2020, not that long ago, we had an economic crash, the third crash of our system in this new century. The dot-com crash in 2000, the subprime mortgage crash in 2008 and 9, and now we call it the COVID crisis. We keep giving funny different names, but you know, we live in a system that has been critical and crisis prone in this way for centuries. And we're just unable to overcome that long lasting problem. On top so of that, we had the pandemic. We had a okay. terrible public health disaster, which made the economic crisis all that much worse. Before Can I just interrupt you for one sure. second? I just want to ask you about that. So do you believe from what you're saying, uh, because a lot of people look at 2020 and say, oh, no, the economy was great, but then the government shut us down. The government was responsible for crashing the economy. You're saying two different things happened in 2020. There was an economic crash and then there was, of course, the pandemic. Do you think the pandemic was used as a way to cover up this economic crash that you think was happening on its own? Well, I do think there were certainly some people who don't like to face up to the fact that we have a crash 
every four to seven years in the history of capitalism. And if you want confirmation, a very conservative governmental agency, the National Bureau for Economic Research, known as the NBER, is the place you go because they keep track of the crises of the crashes. And they're the source of the number every four to seven years on average, the system tanks. That's why if you look at the financial press, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the usual sources in the two or three years before 2020, that's 2018, 2019, they were full of expectations of the next crash because we'd had one in 2008 or nine. If four to seven years is the average, we were due in 2018, if not earlier for the next one. And if we didn't have it then, it was coming and it hit in 2020. By the way, the official start of the crash was 20, uh, 2020 in February, and the uh, COVID didn't arrive until March. I mean, it's very clear we had a crash and then a pandemic that made it worse. Some people would like to say it's all the pandemic's fault because those are folks who don't want to face or admit the crisis-prone instability of the economic system we live in. By the way, there are expectations that we're going to have another one this year or early next year. It's the same logic that is being used by analysts of all political stripes in terms of trying to guess when the next one will hit. It's like hurricanes. We know they're going to happen. We don't know exactly when and how long, but we know what the season is and what the dynamic is. Anyway, I think this one's a bit more obvious, though. I mean, what's happening now, it seems, with inflation uh, and now with the bank collapsing, the banks, uh, you you know, with uh, the Fed pumping money into the central banks of foreign governments, uh, it, it it just seems like this one is a bit more obvious that something's happening. Right. Because let let me finish the chain. So we had the crash. We had the pandemic. Before either of those were over, we had an inflation, one of the worst ones in our history, still going on. And before that was solved, we had rising interest rates that added to all kinds of chaos and confusion. And now we have the banks collapsing. Wow. Wow. That's an awful lot of economic difficulty imposed on any society in a really short historical period of time. History teaches us that if you impose on the mass of your people sequential economic catastrophes too many, too soon, too close together, you're going to have serious social unrest. I'm being as polite as I know how. But look, the last five years of our politics should teach anyone, uh uh-huh, we're seeing the division, the hostility, the bitterness, the separation, the chaos in our politics. Let me drive home also that it is not only the smaller banks, uh, Silicon Valley, Signature Bank in New York, It's also one of the greatest banks in the world. Credit Suisse is the equivalent there of what, I don't know, JP Morgan Chase, Bank America would be here. It's a global behemoth. And yes, it had other problems that were building up. There are always special considerations. But when you have this many banks, and I could go on, First Republic Bank, West Bank, California, more and more of them, and, and here's how it kind of comes together. The Fed has raised interest rates to try to stop the inflation, but the raised interest rates collapse the value of government bonds, which are held by banks. So suddenly what they had invested in, secure government bonds, turned out to have lost big time value, and that brought the banks in or over the brink. What does the Fed now do? If it raises interest rates, which it did Wednesday of this week by a quarter point, that's a kind of weak anti-inflationary step. So they are not going to stop the inflation. Is the inflation now going to get worse? Since the Federal Reserve is giving every bank that has problems with deposits a backstop of going to the Fed to replace them, that's adding money into the system, which is the exact opposite of what you normally do uh, with an inflation. So are we going to revisit inflation? Is that the price we're going to pay to save our banking system? 
We are an economic system that has accumulated problems and it is becoming impossible to solve one of them without worsening the other. That's a very bad sign, not only about the present, but about the future that we face. Yeah, it definitely is eyebrow raising that they raised yep. the rates by 0.25% uh, when the banks are in the situation that they're in right now. It seems like they would have maybe definitely not done nothing or maybe even cut the rate by 0.25 in order to try to give the banks a bit of leeway. Um, but instead, it seems like they're squeezing them maybe even harder with this rate hike. It's not as high as there were some talks of them going up by you know a bit higher than that, and that would have really squeezed the banks. But what do you what do you think they should have done in this situation? Well, what I think they should have done is what I've been saying for quite some months now. There's a very strange, and if I were more of a psychologist, I'd be speculating about it. There's a very strange thing going on with the Federal Reserve. It is telling us and behaving as if the only way to deal with an inflation is by raising interest rates. I find that bizarre. I was in the same Yale University graduate program in, in economics as was Janet Yellen at the same time. We had the same courses, the same professors in the same room. I know what she learned because it's the same thing I learned. And here's what it is. The United States itself is an example of societies who have overcome inflations without raising interest rates. The last time was 1971. A conservative president, Richard Nixon, on 15 August 1971, goes on radio and television at a time of an inflation, says to the American people, we have to bring this inflation to a stop. It's, it's dangerous. It's bad for us. And here's then what he said. As of tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, any business in America that raises its price for anything, we will come for you, we will arrest you, and we'll throw you in jail. Any union or any little working class people who push or get higher wage, the same thing. That policy was known as a wage price freeze. It was instituted initially for 90 days to stop the inflation, which it did so successfully that it was extended for a subsequent period of time. All right. I'm not saying that that policy has no problems. It does. Every policy does. The one being pursued now surely does. But that we don't discuss it, that the Federal Reserve acts as if what I just told you is not part of our relatively recent history, that's a bad sign because it means the people making the decisions don't want to have a public debate about the alternative. And there are other alternatives if you want. I can go through them with you. But here's something that I would suggest. Hey, folks, let's be honest and let's open up. Nixon did a wage price freeze. Roosevelt in the early 40s did a rationing program. Those are two different, widely experienced in many countries, ways of controlling an inflation. They have their pros, their cons, their strengths, their weaknesses. But it's clear if you want to do this, uh, there are alternatives, and they might be, some of them, more important now if we're trying to save our banking system, uh, which has many serious threats beyond those that have been released so far. I'd be glad to go into those if you're interested, but we have to work hard to save our banking system. All of Washington is trying to do that now. Uh, and one of the ways would be to look at the alternative ways of coping with the other problem, inflation, which has absolutely not gone away. Has Have raising interest rates ever curbed inflation? Yes. Some Here's the problem. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Absolutely. We have had situations where we raise interest rates, hope being to stop the inflation. It doesn't work. The inflation goes on, but the higher interest rates crush the economy so that we have more and more unemployment because nobody can borrow money at those high rates. And then we have something we've come to call stagflation, a mixture of stagnation and inflation at the same time. That's a real risk 
That has happened repeatedly in the United States, and it would be naive to think that somehow automatically that's not going to happen. The worst nightmare for Mr. Biden would be that he raises interest rates with Mr. Powell. They get them up there enough to slow the economy down. There are signs that that's already happening, but are not effective in stopping the inflation. Then you'll have the stagflation, which in many ways is the worst of both worlds. It's interesting that this time around, so what what you're uh, mentioning reminds me of 2008, where they were raising the rates, and then ultimately the, the the collapse came with the homeowners, right? The homeowners were the ones that were the most affected by this. This right. time, it's the banks who are the who are the who who did the business, who did the the deal with the Fed by buying the bonds. Uh, in two thousand eight, was the people that got the mortgages from the banks, uh, and, and this time it's the banks who are in trouble because of the the purchasing of these bonds that then the Fed devalued ultimately after selling the bonds to the banks. Um, But interestingly, they're they're willing, it seems, to do something to help the banks. But in 2008, they weren't as willing to do things to help the homeowners. They still did something for the banks when it was the homeowners who were mostly in trouble, not the banks themselves necessarily. So um, that's kind of an interesting thing. It's just something to point out that they're they're kind of willing to save their own. That's right. It's very important. You know, it's 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 usually in Washington. You give the you give the oil and the grease to the creaky wheel. The thing that's not working. The thing that's an imminent crisis that scares you. I mean, we should be scared. Things are really out of control politically, economically. This is a rough time, and there's not. You know, I know our political leaders always want to say everything's under control. Every, That is not true, but I'm not here to blame Republicans or Democrats. I think that's a monstrous waste of time when they bicker and and yell at each other. The responsibility for these problems is many years building up across Republican and Democratic Congresses and presidents. Uh, It's futile and pointless to play those cheap political games with a problem that is really very severe. Two things to think about. One. There are many more problems coming down the pike. I'll give you an example. For the banks and for our country, we have an enormous investment as a nation in office buildings, tall buildings in all of our cities, full of offices. We got a problem. Because of the pandemic and the crash, millions and millions of American office workers are now working at home and are not going back to work anytime soon. What that means is that office buildings are empty. Large numbers of offices in them are empty and not paying rents. Now follow the bouncing ball. If you don't pay rent in your office building, the landlord of that office building is not bringing in the revenue they anticipated. They borrowed billions from American banks to pay for the erection of those buildings to rent the offices. So they can't pay back the banks because their tenants have left the office and are working from home. When will those bad loans that the banks cannot connect, collect on begin to have to be acknowledged That's going to show that all other kinds of banks who never bought government bonds, who were busy in what's called the commercial loan business or other office business, they're going to come up. That's not going to go away. That's not going to magically solve itself. That's going to be another big blow on the banks. And then we have Europe. The reason Europe matters is we're interdependent with Europe, very deeply so. The Europeans right now, for example, the, the, the average rate of in, inflation in Europe right now is 10%. Let me give you an idea of how serious it is there. The three Baltic republics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the inflation rate there is between 20 and 25%. In the Netherlands, one of the most conservative economic systems in the world, it's 17%. Britain just went to 12%. These are double and triple what we have here, and we have a serious problem. And they're raising rates, which means their bonds are going down, and a monstrous bank like Swiss uh, Credit Suisse collapsed. 
And when it collapsed, you saw something which also ought to concern us. The government was so panicked in Switzerland, where Credit Suisse operates, that it forced, and I mean that over the last weekend, forced Union Bank of Switzerland, USB, to purchase, to merge with Credit Suisse. One monster global bank merging with another to become you know, a super monster. But here's an interesting thing. The government made that happen. It did not get a vote by the shareholders of either bank. It did not consult. The, in other words, the government is saving capitalist banks and literally taking them away from the private owners. It's a kind of admission that private capitalism has waltzed its way into a dead end and that the government is literally saving by taking over. And here's an irony. You know what that makes the West look like? Like China. China is also a mixture of private capitalists, a lot of it, and publicly owned and operated enterprises with a communist party kind of coordinating between them, quite successful in terms of economic growth. And we who claim to be their, their opposite or their enemy are actually becoming West Europe and us more and more like them each day. All of these things are gonna play a role in shaking ways of thinking and functioning that people ought to be much more sensitive to than they seem to be. It's interesting that uh, you bring this up, that the West seems to be kind of moving more towards, you know, if we have to nationalize certain things or industries or, or companies, like you mentioned. Uh, what's also interesting, though, is that these more communist countries are also becoming more capitalist. So there does seem to be this balance that ends up being struck. I mean, countries that have tried to go full communism, ultimately in one lifetime or less, have moved towards a more capitalistic model. We've seen that happen in China, Vietnam. If Cuba has the opportunity, you know they're going to do it. So we've got this, this blending that's happening. Where do you think uh, from those two, what, is there a sweet spot? Is there maybe a spot economically where we can land where it is a blend between capitalism and communism that ends up uh, and I know, you know, for for both sides, if you're major capitalist, communism is a dirty word. If you are a com, if you're more communist and think that's a better way to be, capitalism is a to terrible, dirty word. But is there a place in the middle where societies can still thrive? People can have private property, private businesses. They can still innovate, and at the same time, we don't end up with this cyclical crisis mode that we do know capitalism puts people. And I would say. The problem with capitalism, from my viewpoint, is the constant cyclical crises that we always end up in. Um, and the problem with communism is a lack of abundance, I would say, that capitalism seems to bring us. Communism doesn't seem to bring us much abundance, but it doesn't bring so much of the cyclical crises that we're always in, like you mentioned, every few years. So is there a spot where we could land? And will we end up there just by, you know, a lot of times these economic systems shift because of revolutions. Are we headed for a revolution that would ultimately shift the economic landscape of the country? Well, you know, that is what we used to call the $64,000 question when there was that TV program uh, with that name. Yeah, look, there's, there's a good prognosis and a bad one, a, a pleasant scenario and a scary scenario. Here's the pleasant scenario, that we are in a peculiar way uh, converging, that what's emerging is that China, to use them as the example, decided they needed to allow and to support a big private capitalist sector of their economy, partly owned and operated by Chinese citizens and a very large part owned and operated by foreign citizens, including American, Japanese, Western European, and so on. And they have a what we might call a hybrid, state enterprises run by the government, private enterprises run by capitalists, they have a stock market, shareholding, all of that, okay? Now, in order to coordinate these two differences, they have a powerful political communist party sitting on top of that. That's how they've worked it. But let's be honest, which I know is hard for some folks. Over the last 30 years, the most rapid growth of the economy has been achieved in China by that system. Look, 
on average, they've grown their GDP, their output of goods and services, between 6 and 9% over the last 30 years. We've grown ours between 2 and 3%. That's not even close. That's why they've caught up. That's why they are the powerful country that they have become, three times faster than the United States for an immense long period of time. Even a poor country like China catches up. Okay, so most of the world is poor, and most of the world has as a very high priority to no longer be poor. Well, if that's your goal, if that's your priority, China is the model, and that's showing up all over the world. That's what the BRICS is all about. That's that's why we saw a week ago the Chinese foreign minister bringing the Sunni and Shiite wings of Islam together with a peace treaty between warring countries, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Amazing to watch. And then we have the irony that here in the United States, private capitalism is turning to the government more and more to save it, to help it, to smooth it over difficulties. So, yeah, there is a kind of coming to something similar. We don't have a dominant political party. On the other hand, both of our parties are trying to work this thing out pretty much in the same way with some differences. But it kind of looks like two wings of a party. Uh, China doesn't doesn't bother with two. They have one doing it all. And there are differences there, and I understand that. But I would hope that there could be an understanding we're not that different. Can't we come to some way of organizing the world economy, since it really is now a world economy, that allows each of us to grow, allows each of us to survive? Because the alternative is a war, and, and that's the end. I mean, right. look how close we are in, in Ukraine already to this kind of situation. And I have a model to suggest. You know, when the United States stopped being a colony of Britain, when we had a war, the War of Independence, 1776, we broke away violently from the colonial master, King George III of England. A few years later, in 1812, the British tried again to squash this new thing militarily, and they were defeated again. After which the British decided, it's a long history, but I'm condensing it. The British decided, don't fight it. You can't win. They can defeat you. They've done it twice. So why don't you learn, stop killing each other, stop the wars that you lose, and work out a live and let live between the United Kingdom on one hand and the United States on the other. And for the next well, since today, up until today, that's been the rule, even though the roles have been reversed, where England was powerful, the United States was a poor colony, the United States is now powerful, and England, I don't mean to be impolite, but it's ba- barely above being a poor colony of the United States. So even with that bigger transformation, they haven't gone to war again, they haven't been you know, blustering at each other, they've worked out an arrangement. I don't see why, given the greater stakes today, we aren't busy stopping threatening one another, stopping fighting over really whatever else you think of them, secondary problems to the survival of the world. Here are two powers converging anyway on the core internal economic systems they have and the need to avoid a war that none of them wants, why don't we see more efforts to work out a a live and let live deal between them that honors what each of them finds to be the important things about their own society, letting the other society be different? And you bring up a great point. There's certainly uh, that that should absolutely be possible. If the United if the United States and the UK can do it after being warring nations with one another, then right. every nation on earth should be able to work together, leaving each other alone, even working together in business deals. That's what the United States and the United Kingdom have done. But we know the answer, and we know the reason why we cannot do that. And a lot, uh, uh, largely, it's because unfortunately the United States built massive industry on war. That they have to keep it. They have to keep it going. People need to get paid. Bombs need to be built so that those people could get paid. And that's unfortunately that uh, the the reality of the situation is that we've just built an economy of war 
Uh, and that's so we just keep going at it. We keep uh, posturing against other nations and uh, rattling, you know, feathers and uh, poking let, bears. Let me, let me offer a bit of a daring, but a way to deal with what exact point you brought up. Suppose we we go to the rest of the world and we say to them, we are the most militarily equipped country in the world, which is true. Our military budget, as many people have shown, is greater than the combined budgets of the next nine countries in terms of military spending. So we are, and much of the world, poll after poll shows this, much of the world is terribly afraid of the United States. I know that worries some people, but it is the truth. That's what the polls keep showing us, and nobody has shown me evidence, and I'm interested uh, that it might be other than that. Okay, so we have something, ironically. Suppose we go to the world and we say, we are willing to drastically reduce our military overwhelmingness. We'll keep some as a kind of final defense. I get that. People feel the need for that. But we're going to take the bulk of it, and we're going to help the rest of the world. We're going to have a Marshall Plan like we did after World War II, only it's the whole world. And the point is, we want to show that we are willing to create greater standards of living elsewhere in the world to lessen the conflict, the bitterness, the anger, the war-inducing envy, whatever words you want. That would, the world would be grateful. The world would see the debt it has. It is an act of generosity, but it is driven by self interest. It makes us safer than this endless buildup of our military and our bases everywhere in the world. Look, there's an unpleasant truth, but those are, you know, those are the ones you have to face. Every the only problem empire with that idea. Go ahead. Every empire in the world has been born, evolved over time, and passed away. The Greek, the Roman, the Persian, the Turkish, the British, you name it. The last hundred years have been the rise of the American empire for all kinds of reasons, and the whole world knows it. But now it is over. I know that's difficult. I'm an American. I'm born in Ohio in the middle of the country. I've lived and worked here all my life. It's hard. I can get that. You can see it if you study the history of the decline of the Roman or the British or any other empire. But we're no longer on the upswing. We've plateaued and it's tending. That's why we have all these problems. That's why we're having such difficulties. And we all know where the other next empire is growing just like the british after a while must have noticed that that little colony in north america is becoming the next colossus but we see it early there's still time sit down with the next one so it doesn't become an oppressive empire at least make the effort to work something out because it's in the history of empires that we also see where we are and we ought to take a hint from that about what kinds of things we ought to be doing. And you see that next great empire is being China. China is inevitably. Oh, no, no question. The whole world. Right. I mean, Americans want not to see it, which is understand. Who wants to see the decline of the empire? You're frightened. Right. It'll take away my job. It'll take away my income. It'll take. I get that. that those are natural, normal anxieties. But you can't let them govern you because you will make mistaken calculations, mistaken judgments that will make your situation worse. That's why Britain had to go to war twice before it figured out this is not the way. I'm hoping we don't have to do that again as if we can't learn from history. Let's work it out. It's less of a danger. Here's my bottom line. It's less of a danger to try that than to go the road we're going now, which is yeah. you know heading in a direction we all kind of see whether we talk to each other honestly about it or not. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you that we that uh, war is not the answer. There, there are definitely better ways. And even if we look at the former empires that used to run the world, they're not in a bad position. And, you know, it's like we can think, oh, no, this is doom and gloom. We're going to be ruined. But when you look at the UK, are they ruined? You know, are they are they having a tough time? You look at these other places and uh, and they're just fine. The people go on with their lives. They don't need to they don't have this feeling like we need to be the great power on Earth that's going around bullying and, and ensuring that everybody is afraid of us. They don't have that feeling anymore. Um, but my with your suggestion of us going around and uh, helping other countries. What's interesting about that, two points. For one, that seems like what China is doing, and that is mm -hmm. how they're gaining global yep. dominance over us is by making yep. those partnerships around the world, building up those countries. But of course, the narrative, and this is what's interesting about that then, and maybe it's true, interesting to get your opinion on this, but the narrative then is, if they go around and they help these countries, these countries are going to be beholden to them in some way. They're going to own them in some way. They're going to have dominance over them economically, in which case it's a new form of imperialism. Rather than going and conquering uh, physically through war, you're doing it economically. The suggestion that the United States do that, I can't see a situation where the United States does that just out of our own goodwill because we're nice people. I see it would happen because there's an actual profit motive to it. There's some sort of other or, or power motive to it. Um, and then it, you would end up with sort of a global... Uh, global governing that a lot of people do not want, myself included. I don't really want to live in a under a global governor, you know, governance that uh, we're all so different. The, the countries are so different. State by state, we're so different. Trying to have a federal government is difficult enough in the United States. Having a global government, I just don't see how that would work out with the differences of all the nations. But that suggestion seems to me like that's exactly where that would lead: is power over others. So how well, would we do it without doing that? Let me respond. I don't think out of the goodness of our souls, whatever that actually is, much is going to happen. I think it's self-interest. I think most American businesses, and I know a, a whole bunch of them. I've been involved in that in my life. Most American businesses will tell you they're not interested in, I mean, the defense industry is aside. But other than them, and, and they're big, but they're not the whole economy, and they never were. Most of them don't want war. War is not good for business, for most businesses. War is not. Look at the conflict between the United States and China, which is well short of war. We've had trade wars and tariff wars. Most American businesses don't want that. I don't know if, you're, if your viewers are aware, but the United States Chamber of Commerce, which is a very conservative business organization, didn't want the tariff wars with China that Mr. Trump imposed. They don't want them to continue with Mr. Biden. And they have made their point of view very clear. They want free trade. That's more in their interest as businesses. Look, the fastest growing market in the world today is the People's Republic of China. If you take a course in a business school, and I've taught there, a master of MBA, you get a degree. Here's what you're taught. If you want to succeed as a capitalist business, be where the wages are the lowest and the market is growing the fastest. Okay, I hate to tell you, but that's been China for the last 30 years. That's why everybody wants in there. That's why the competitors in Europe and Japan and the United States have been moving and relocating business into that place for a long time. It's profitable that drives it. Rather than a war that destroys, uh, a peaceful arrangement allows them to profit and we to profit. There be some division of the market. There already is. That's how different enterprises work the market of Kentucky or, or California or New York. We would begin to do that now on a global basis. And I think your concern about not wanting a, go a global government makes sense, but that has to be fought for. Can we have political arrangements that allow all kinds of diversity and difference among how different? Look, we have, as you put it, we have that struggle in the United States. We have a federal system, and then we have this struggle with the states, and sometimes it can be worked out pretty well. Other times they clash. We can do that on an international basis, and there will be moments of conflict and disagreement but that's a better, look, the alternative is a nuclear war. I mean, it's nuts 
what we are doing. Everybody understands which of those two is worse. And to think that somehow we'll never have one of those wars, I do want to remind you that we are in the early part of the 21st century. In the 20th century, we had the two worst wars in human history, World War I and II, devastating on a global scale. We are, unfortunately, a race, a human race of people that are able to slaughter each other on a scale that is mind-bending. I'm not saying that we'll have to do that again, but we have to be aware that we have that capacity and work to prevent it from overwhelming us. Yeah, it's definitely in our interest to be working with China, not against yeah. China. Same thing with Russia, working with right. them, not against them. Um, it, certainly. I, I, when it comes to China and the economic growth, though, I think it's maybe a little unfair to uh, to compare. I don't know if you were necessarily comparing, but it seems that it's only a matter of time before that economic growth slows down in China. One thing that they have that obviously is very different than the United States is that a population of people very poor who are willing to do the hard labor jobs, manufacturing jobs that people in America don't seem to be as willing or wanting to do. That was an immigrant's job. The United States grew rapidly because of those immigrants who came in in a very similar situation to the people of China who wanted to work and they were willing to do those gritty jobs in order to make a better life. And they do those jobs with the idea in mind that their children wouldn't have to. That is what every parent thinks. So that's what's yeah. going on in China with that rapid growth. But at some point that slows down. The people there are thinking, I've done this laborious job because I'm hoping my child will go off and uh, be a white collar worker instead of a blue collar worker. And eventually that is going to shift. So, so uh, I think it's inevitable, in my view, that China will slow down this economic growth. And that would then have to shift to maybe another part of the world. I think that's, in my, uh, my opinion, that is actually why they're helping Africa build up, because I do think that their, their plan is they know this, and they're going to have to start shifting that economic growth down to Africa, where they're willing to do those laborious jobs uh, when the Chinese people are now comfortable like Americans and wanting to do white-collar jobs. What are your thoughts on that? No, I, th I, I could not agree more. I think that's all true. I think Americans deluded themselves uh, for most of the last 30 years in telling each other that what you just described will happen soon. It didn't happen soon. The Chinese figured out, and they deserve the credit for this, they figured out how to keep that going, how to move, and, and history will look back on the Chinese experiment with, with almost awe. They moved hundreds of millions of people inside China from the rural, poverty-stricken areas to the coastal areas from uh, Tianjin and Beijing in the north all the way down to Shanghai and ha Hong Kong in the south, moved them to the coastal areas, industrialized them, created these enormous cities. You know, in Europe too, we took agricultural rural people and made them urban, but we did it over three centuries. The, the Chinese took a larger number of people and did it in three decades. Yeah. I mean, it is mind bending what they have accomplished. And I don't see the need to pretend otherwise. I think you're right. They understand what you said. This can't go on forever. The children don't want to work in a the factory. They don't want to work like their parents have. They've seen that. They've grown up as the children. It happens everywhere. It happens to successive waves of immigrants here in the United States. It always has. And they're planning, and I think you're right, they're making deals all over the world, Africa, but all through the Middle East, into Eastern Europe. Uh, they're going everywhere, planning, because that's part of their way of doing things, planning, rather than allowing the market to determine this, planning their way of coping, because they have to worry about something we don't. They have created the expectation in hundreds of millions of people. Let me remind everybody, China has four times the population of the United States. So they have many more people. They have moved them into the urban areas. They've moved them into industrial jobs. If they can't keep that growth going, then those people's jobs become uncertain. 
And what are you going to do then? You can't send them back into the country. That's impossible. They will not permit it, the people. So you are on a kind of, you've got to keep growing to keep this game going. And Lord help you, if you can't, you'll have a revolution right inside China. They know that. And if they don't, we know it. So in other words, not only do we have the pressures that lead us to try to make peace with them, they have their pressures to deal with as well. They need accommodations to keep their game going, just as we need it in this society. I'm not asking for people to think in terms of peace out of some lovely ideal about how it's better. I mean, I do think it's better, but that's not my argument. My argument is self-interest. To keep these economies going, you better reorganize the world in a way that's acceptable to others. Otherwise, you risk your own situation deteriorating on you. So let's talk about that. What would be the new system that the United States could shift to? Um, you've written a book, Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself. So right. what is the solution then? If capitalism isn't the answer what is the answer and how do we get there without a revolution? Or unless you think it's the only way that we're just headed for revolution and that's that's how it's happened in most of the world. Is that where we're headed? What are we well, shifting to? You know, you're answering your own question, Kim, in a way. It has been the answer in many cases. I don't think it has to be, but it often has, be, has been and we would be silly to pretend, uh, to pretend otherwise. Let me put my answer this way. We have tried endless reforms. We've tried to fix capitalism, to improve it, to do this and that. Let me remind people, for example, that 100 years ago, if you had walked around New York City, where I live, you would have seen factory after factory, office after office, full of children, six, seven, eight years old, working a full-time job, all right? Eventually, Americans decided, as other countries have too, that this is very bad for society. Children should be in school. Children should have time to play. It's, it, it's terrible. Uh, I won't go into the boring. We, we, and we said we want to eliminate child labor. And the corporation said, are you crazy? That's the only way we can make money. We have to be able uh, to hire workers and pay them what we pay these children. Plus, we're doing a nice service. Poor families are poor. If they couldn't send their kids out to work, they'd be even poorer. You know, the kinds of arguments we normally hear. And after a certain point, it, it lasted for a while, those arguments. But after a certain point, the groundswell was simply too strong, and we abolished child labor. Okay, I understand people don't want to do certain kinds of things, but in the end, guess what? Capitalism didn't collapse. We didn't all fall apart. It turns out that capitalism could be fixed in some ways, in this case, in the case of child labor, and we could get on to a capitalism that didn't. I mean, we still have it. We have a whole bureau in the U.S. Department of Labor that hunts down employers that abuse children. And we have plenty of those, but not on the scale we once did. It was a reform that worked. After every bank collapse, and we have had dozens of them, we have reformed the banking system. But those reforms never worked. Glass-Steagall, the most famous after the Great Depression, uh, was abolished. 1999, President Clinton signed the end of Glass-Steagall. Seven years later, we had the crash of 2007 and 8. We had a whole lot of reforms after 2007 and 8 in the banking system. You know, the um, uh, Barney Frank and the others who made the Dodd-Frank business. And now we have another collapse. I mean, it should... The reforms were undone by the very industry that was supposed to be regulated. It did what we call in economics regulatory capture. When the industry that's supposed to be regulated captures the regulators ostensibly regulating them. Okay, many of our reforms don't work. And they don't work for one basic reason. We leave in place a tiny group of people the boards of directors of a corporation. Let's remember, that's usually between 10 and 20 people that comprise the board of a corporation. 
and they typically hire hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of employees. Employers are a small minority. Employees are the vast majority. And yet in every enterprise, all the power to decide what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the product are in the hands of the little minority, which is not elected to that job. The employees who live with the results and the rest of us who do too, are not part of that decision. We don't vote for these people. We don't recall them if we're unhappy with what they're doing. In other words, our business system is structured in a fundamentally undemocratic way. Therein is our problem. If you want to solve, if you want to make the economy work for everybody, then everybody has to be involved. It's the same logic that led us to get rid of kings and queens, except as ornaments. We are governed by parliaments where we elect the people. Lots of problems with parliaments. I understand that. But very few people want to go back to being a monarchy. My guess is if we change the monarchy that is every business into a democracy, a community, we would make better decisions and we would make them more understandable to the people who have to live with the results and therefore more acceptable. And I think that's the direction a solution needs to think about. Otherwise, we're going to, well, I'll, I'll put it in a dramatic way. Capitalism can pass, but we should not let it take the rest of us down with it. So this actually, um, what you're describing, I think, is what you're most known for. And this is worker yeah. co-ops. Is that what you're discussing? Is that what you're, you're yep. describing? Exactly. So, exactly. That's um, one and form. I've, I've always been interested in this, um, in understanding this a little bit better. From my limited understanding of worker co-ops, I just don't see how this could possibly work. <laughs> I, I, I just don't see how. Um, I, I've been in environments where all of us, you know, there was no boss. Um, and that, that all of us sort of made decisions together. And ultimately, people inherently are lazy. I mean, I, I just think people are inherently lazy. And people will always go the, the, the path of least resistance. And the mm -hmm. person that wants to innovate, the person that wants to work, the person that says, well, we need to do more in order to make a better product of some kind. And the others right. say, nah, you know, my life is fine the way it is. I like to work less. So we're going to vote to work less and to not do this new innovative thing. That is what um, I think the failure of trying to run a company by committee where all the workers, am I, am I not understanding workers co-ops? No, it's not so much that you're not understanding. It's more that you kind of have to let yourself go a little bit and imagine something a little bit different. Let me try to explain. When the transitions out of slavery or out of feudalism to capitalism happened, many people said what exactly you said. A plantation works because the master and the overseers make sure that if you have no master and no overseers, nothing's going to happen. The, the, the plantation will go to seed. The, the cotton will not be planted or picked or it, there has to, because people can't think mostly out of what they know. It's, it's, it's a normal human thing. So it's hard to prefigure the next phase of human history. And you, by the way, you have it on the other side. Many of the advocates for an end of slavery talked about freedom. Well, they had a bitter lesson. They got rid of slavery. Freedom, they didn't get. You know, so my, my response to you would be, look, if a society of community worker co-ops noticed what you're saying, that they were slowing down on innovation, that they weren't, they weren't growing new products, new techniques, all the, all the stuff that we call technological progress, then they would have to address that question. They would have to solve it. Here's a way to solve it. If you're part of a co-op and the majority votes to do something with which you are deeply opposed because of this and that, here are mechanisms for you to leave. 
and to take with you whatever portion of that co-op agrees with you about a dynamic approach. The society makes that available. Just as in our society, uh, large numbers of corporations don't want to spend the money to do R&D. Okay, the government gives them a tax break. You do R&D, we'll lower your taxes. Or the company gives a grant to the university, which leads the chemistry department in that university nearby um, to make an arrangement with the company. It gets some money and its professors and graduate students begin to work on a project. that get, That's a lot of our technical progress gets done. That was an adjustment in which the private sector interacts with the governmental sector or the university sector to try to do something about, and that's what computers come out of that idea and so forth. A, a society of worker co-ops would make the same adjustments. If it isn't getting technological change, okay, what do we do to get it? Now, they would do it differently because they would look for technological change while holding on to what they believe in, worker co-ops. Whereas we in our society did what? Develop technological change while holding on to our capitalist system because those were our values let me do it one last way okay when the chinese made their revolution in 1949 and they set up their communist government with all the the, the trauma of a revolutionary way of doing that americans including many of my professors and me too felt that the, the country is so poor uh, that trying in a, in a collectivist, socialist, whatever you want to call it, way, it's going to take them forever. They, they need to liberate the entrepreneurial, all that stuff. We were wrong, and we won't admit it. The Chinese have caught up in record time. China is the only country that can compete with the United States now at the highest level of technology. It's amazing what they did, but they along the way, they paid a heavy price. I'm not endorsing China. I'm not celebrating it. They're full of problems. All of that's true. But when it comes to these questions of economic growth, of high tech, they deserve the recognition of what they have achieved. You know, the most po among my students, the most popular social platform is TikTok. That's a Chinese achievement. Why should we pretend otherwise? They can do it. They can do it on a scale that Europe can. That's very significant. Let us try to figure out what we misunderstood so we understand it better, rather than, than pretending, you know, otherwise we're like a three-year-old who sees a scary doggy, puts his or her hands in front of her eyes and imagines that if you can't see the doggy, it's not there and has to learn <laughs> the doggy's still there. Okay, but a couple of things. So China does yes. have a leader at the top yes. that ultimately does make the decision. So um, people can, you know, propose what they would like. and But ultimately, there is somebody, like you mentioned, a centralized government that is ultimately guiding all of the and, and ensuring all the levers and the mechanisms work together. So somebody has yes. to be doing that. It's not really ruled by committee in China. Absolutely. It is. You're absolutely right. Yes. By the, the way. The thing about, yes. No, no, just by the way, he is, in that sense, a dictator. I right. understand that. I don't right. dispute that. I don't like that either. But I want to remind everyone that the CEO in most corporations has pretty much the same power. Right. It's and the if same. We don't, it's, right, right. Very similar organization. If we don't like it in the one place, which I don't, then we need to be a bit critical of where it exists everywhere else. Go ahead. Okay. But with the co-op, with the workers' co-op that you were describing, I can see your point. I, I can absolutely understand that, okay, if there's a non-productive worker in the co-op, that has a different vision, then maybe they just go and start another worker co-op somewhere right. else with people that are like-minded. So you're saying ultimately like-minded people will stick together in these workers' co-ops. And uh, if, if somebody wants more production and more innovation, they will either go, they will either share, their, their, their fellow workers will say, yeah, you're right, we're not outputting much, we gotta step it up. Or, or they'll or. just go and start another worker co-op with people who are like-minded. Right. But that right. only works in a capitalistic system, ultimately. I mean, you can't have, you can't 
uh, you, you have to have the motivation for that innovation, for that output. So you would have to have some sort of profit motive in that. So society itself, I, I could understand moving to a worker co-op scenario only if we maintained economic capitalism in order to motivate. If we went to a system that was more socialism or more state-run of uh, shared uh, resources, you know, if we, if we, let's say, eliminated private, you know, if we went really extreme and said, we're going to eliminate private property, we're going to nationalize everything, uh, we're going to have, everyone is entitled to all of these variety of things, um, and we're all just going to share the resources that, uh, that we all manufacture together. That isn't going to work if you're going to, you're not going to motivate the people to then, you've got to have that motivation there. So I would think that the worker co-op could work in the vision that you just uh, laid out for me. I can understand that if and only if it is within the framework of a capitalist society. Okay, let me respond, if you allow me, um, with some psychology. Suppose you, you, for principled reasons, you rule out the profit motive the way you just you know, laid out. The question is, are there other motives that could get people to be technologically innovative? Because that's what you want. You want people to think creatively, to problem solve, to come up with new and better ways of whatever it is they're engaged with. Suppose you then, suppose you discovered a, in a worker co-op system that you weren't getting that, 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 that without the profit motive, indeed, things were slowing down. Okay, suppose you do the following. Any innovation that makes it, for example, need less labor to get a certain output than it used to because you came up with a new machine or a new chemistry or whatever it is you did. We're going to give you a year off, all expenses paid, travel around the world, a medal, and a nice chunk of change in your savings account. Suppose you would be celebrated in the country. You'd be on television talking to everybody. We would have programs devoted to trying to understand why you, unlike your fellow workers, have been creative in this way. What was it about your schooling or your upbringing or your family? It becomes a really a national a celebration, the way we kind of celebrate an outstanding movie star or an outstanding athlete or some, we study them and we amount what, you know, and they're, they're celebrities and they're celebrated. Suppose we did this really systematically to say, hey, we're going to recognize if you go out of your way, if you do that extra, if you apply yourself, we're going to give you a reward. It doesn't happen to be making you Elon Musk. You're not going to sit on an amount of money you can't spend anyway. We're not going to do it that way. But we are going to give you recognition to being an outstanding member of this community and celebrated as such. You know my feeling? I think most people are motivated by a complicated set of things. Love of other people, approval of other people, not just cash in the bank. And if you're a different kind of society, one kind of approval would go down and another kind would become more important because that's how the society is set up. And I think, again, I don't want to overdo this because China has its problems, but they learned that they can do a great deal with non-monetary incentives and rewards alongside the monetary. I think they allowed their private capitalist sector to go on because you're right. It is a way of motivating people and they made, they made use of it. But there are others and they made use of those too. And maybe that's the trick, not, not to choose either or, but again, the hybrid, if there are people who have to be motivated by profit, give them the opportunity to do that. And if there are others who don't need it, let's take advantage of that. Then we don't have to have a war or any other form of conflict between these different systems. Let the differences sit there and over time, people will make a decision. If they don't like a 50-50 split, maybe have this a 25-75 division. The right. Chinese is only one hybrid system. There could be a million of them. You are still describing, though, a meritocracy. Ultimately, it's um, so, which is interesting because a lot of people sort of equate 
uh, these sort of worker co-ops or socialism or Marxism with, uh, with the doing away of a meritocracy. But what you are describing is still a meritocracy. There will still be winners and losers. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, for me, Interesting. It, I've been a critic of meritocracy, but not because the idea of recognizing merit I'm not against that. I'm in favor of that. I like that. I think that's fair to do. If you've done the extra, then you get the recognition that comes from that because you've made a contribution that should be should be recognized. What I've always been angry about, and I say this basically very personally, is when meritocracy is the veneer and the reality is not, nothing of the sort. Let me tell you personally, I went to Harvard then I went to Stanford and I finished my education at Yale. So I'm like a joke, a poster boy for the elite education. And at every one of those schools, I was taught about what a meritocracy America is. Not just America kind of in general, but those universities. This is a meritocracy. Well, I lived in the dorms and all my friends were fellow students. And I, what am I going to say to you? Half of my classes were people who were there because they came from the right family, because they had a ton of money, because their folks gave money to the universe, or, or six other reasons like that. They weren't there because of their merit. A good number of them hated being there. They were only there because their parents wanted them to be there, and they didn't, you know, they couldn't push against that, which I had sympathy for. These were my friends. But the notion that we were told every day that this is a meritocracy. That was a crock. And, and I have a bad feeling about the whole idea because it was so often invoked and it was so rarely true. Professor, it's been really interesting chatting with you today. Um, really enjoyed the conversation and, uh, and yeah. having a better understanding. And I think you bring up a lot of really great points. And I do I do hope that the people viewing this keep an open mind to ideas. I know we do, we do have a tendency to get very stuck in our viewpoints. We hear certain words and they automatically trigger a negative response. And instead, we should have a more open mind. We should look at everything, examine everything. Like you mentioned, even read the Communist Manifesto, whether you believe in communism, you, you can even hate communism, but you should still read. I, I myself, I studied philosophy in school. I, I, I do believe that you should, the way to open your mind, the way to understand the world in a better way is to see things from every viewpoint, even if you're just gonna argue against it the entire time, you still have to understand it in order to argue against it, right? In order to say, I'm rejecting this idea, you have to at least understand the idea. And, and you maybe- might, and, you might, and you might learn something. You and know. you might learn something. You might agree with it when you're done. You might yeah. say, I didn't think I would agree, but here I am agreeing, you never know. So I think right. it's very fascinating to have these conversations. And I know that you are, uh, you know, quite frankly, a triggering person for a lot of people. They see, they, oh no, the, Mar the, the commie is here. <laughs> but you bring up really great points. And I do think people yeah. should learn and listen um, a lot more to the things that you have to say. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, my, my pleasure. And I want to thank you for having the openness. That's the, one of the best things about the United States that, that in a way it tried more than many countries to be open to stay open to, to talk about every issue has its two sides or three sides and 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 to be that way you're keeping that part of america alive that's a wonderful part of this system and and it's in danger more these days than perhaps than it has been in a long time and you're pushing against it and we all owe you a thanks for doing it well thank you thank you so much professor wolf Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, I thought that was a really, uh, a really interesting conversation with Professor Richard Wolff and um, good to get some clarity on some of his viewpoints on things. I've always been really interested in knowing more about those workers co-ops. So it's really great that we were, we were able to talk about that and also just his solutions. I think um, looking back at how uh, Richard Nixon dealt with I extreme inflation is something that maybe our government should be looking at is price freezes. Um, you know, there's a lot of maybe different ways to do this, but I do know we are in an economic crisis right now and something's got to give. So um, hope you enjoyed that conversation. Thank you guys so much for watching. 
Now, up until the end of the month, if you go to birchgold.com slash Kim, you could qualify for a free safe to be shipped directly to your door on qualifying purchases. If you want to diversify your investments because you are worried about the economy, you're worried about what is going on, then you can actually diversify into precious metals by going to birchgold.com slash Kim. Um, they will send you a free info kit. You can also then talk to a specialist and you can either buy physical gold or other precious metals that you want to keep in that safe if you end up qualifying uh, for one of those free safes to be shipped to you. Or you could convert your existing 401k or IRA into an IRA in precious metals. Either way, they're going to walk you through that process to figure out what is best for you so that you can ensure your retirement, ensure your future. Don't rely on whatever decisions the government's going to make because I don't know. I don't know what, what they're doing and, and where we're headed. Um, but uh, at this point, outlook not so good, right, at the moment. So if you want to diversify and uh, your retirement, do that through Birch Gold by going to birchgold.com slash Kim to get that free info kit.